Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship. It is 2021. We're so excited to be here. It's going to be a great event tonight, and uh, I hope that you enjoy it. A couple little intro items to start us out. First of all, show your love for Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship by joining us on meetup.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. That's where we push out a lot of our notifications there. And you can subscribe on Twitch and YouTube to catch all of the action for each of our events. So that's where you can find us on social media. I also just want to first of all call out, thank you members for being a part of Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship. We wouldn't be here without you and you are uh, so important to making this happen. Also want to call out thank you to Kruger Digital, our sponsor who helps to support uh, our show, our, our meetup. And I want to let you know that at the end of the meetup, we'll be giving away a free JetBrains license. So stick around for that. We'll have a uh, giveaway there at the very end. Also want to call out our upcoming meetups. So our next month is already scheduled. We're going to be doing What Time Is It Anyway with Tyler Jennings. I'm really looking forward to that. this one. It's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, I hope that you'll join us for that one. You can RSVP now. It's going to be great. When I want to say thank you to Cassandra Ferris. Uh, can we get uh, a little applause for Cassandra in the chat here? Maybe just to get an emoji started. What do you say? Welcome, Cassandra. So let's talk about emoji. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Cassandra. Have fun. Uh, all right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm glad Michael has got us on the posting emojis train. Um, we're going to be using the chat a little bit. This is one thing that I haven't quite figured out how to work in person, but in a virtual format, we can take advantage of the chat a little bit. So I want everybody to post their favorite emoji in the chat. I don't know which one's mine. There's a few. So let's see, we have the dancer. We also have the interesting thing, and we'll talk a little bit about this, about how emoji come through looking different on different platforms. Um, somebody looks shocked. Somebody has, looks like a straight-faced robot. <laughs> the devil, I love it, the little demon. A football of the pointy ball variety. I am a fan of football in the European variety. All right, cool. And post an emoji that describes you. some consistency. I see the blonde like dude with the, I think he's called customer service guy. Nice, we have a musician, somebody who's a very frustrated software developer, it looks like from the face palming. Um, I posted a rainbow because I'm, uh, one of the things I work on is a lot of diversity and inclusion type work. So that's why I put the rainbow chat. All right, and finally, what emoji do you think is the most confusing? Purple heart, the like little confused face. That's a good one. Yeah, the upside down smiley. It's so like, I actually had Googled what that meant. Um, and it's kind of a like, well, is this okay? Is it not? It's almost like a head tilt is how it can be interpreted. But these can also be interpreted different ways. You were just talking about the upside down emoji. What was your take on it? I like the emoji art with the eyeballs and the lips. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing the 
the cool thing is like there's the the keyboard emojis there's also just the custom emojis that everybody's posting that's a lot of fun somebody's confused by the acorn um the little like finger pinch i think that's like a and i approve hand gesture the winky face yeah that can get a little confusing especially if you're in a personal <laughs> text settings so emoji then i'm sure some of you have probably seen this meme um I saw this meme, this is a few years ago, as you can tell by how the emojis are older, but it just cracked me up because we'll talk a little bit more about how hieroglyphics and emoji are not the same thing, but there's a lot of similarities and it's kind of funny that we now use pictures a lot to communicate. Like there are, I threatened, I didn't do this, but I threatened that I was gonna take a day and only text people with emojis and no words, but I didn't actually do that. But yeah, nowadays we are using images to communicate, but if you think about it, and as I said in the abstract, way back in the days of cave paintings before we had writing people used images to communicate and we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of communication the role of images and imagery and pictures and how that translates from print into computers as we go through this talk so time to tell you a little bit about me i did um shamelessly plagiarize this slide from another talk that i give on personal branding basically that's a lot of stuff about me in emoji form my name is Cassandra Ferris. I work as the tech community manager at the Rocket Mortgage Division of Quicken Loans. I've been in that job for seven or eight weeks now, so I'm brand new um, in the developer relations group. And what we do, Rocket Mortgage does online mortgage processing. What my group does is we're actually in the process of open sourcing some of our projects and maintaining our open source products. So a lot of our focus is around increasing open source. Thank you for the congratulations. Uh, got the job actually through friends. Um, this isn't a networking talk, but I do a lot of networking talks and I got the job through basically friends. I'm actually working with a friend um, and for another friend. So um, what else about me? I'm a big soccer fan. The black and yellow you see behind me is Columbus Crew, not Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, in normal life, I like to travel. I'm a runner, this little fox. Uh, I have corgis and to me, this little fox looks a little bit like a corgi. I also have a cat, like music. so. That's me. So the idea for this talk came when I was actually doing a talk on mental health and tech. And I wanted a way to illustrate a hard topic that would be A, kind of more inclusive than using stock photos and trying to balance everything, but also to kind of keep things a little bit brighter because that talk can get very heavy. And so throughout this talk, I had a series of emojis that would, um, like there's one where I talk about how stressed and burnout I was. And so I have a, a slide where you get the like a calendar a phone and like a computer and just like the drained you know stressed out face and so i wound up using these recurring emoji slides in this talk to kind of demonstrate the effects and of things in our lives and how they affect our moods but the problem was that i made the mistake of googling for emoji pictures and i landed on a website called emojipedia and Emojipedia is actually run by the Unicode Consortium folks, but it basically just sent me on this rabbit trail learning about emoji, and I decided that I wanted to do a talk on them. Um, and then since then, I've used emoji kind of as my go-to art in a lot of my slides because it's, I said, I don't have to worry about stock photos, I don't have to worry about licensing. Now you can actually get the emoji is, um, you can actually get the emojis through your keyboard. So I realized in PowerPoint, I could just type the emoji in. Um, so yeah, and that kind of brought me up to a point about, just curious about like, how did we get to emoji and where did they come from? And so I got to thinking about that, did some research and have been actually baking this talk for a, a long while, but it was canceled due to a layoff and then canceled due to COVID. And so debuting it tonight. But by happenstance, one day I'm scrolling through Twitter as I'm like working through the notes on this talk and I discovered a book called Because Internet. If anybody's heard of or read this book, um, raise your hand, put a hand raising emoji in the chat. It's a really cool book. It's relatively newer. The author Gretchen McCullough is a, She's actually a, a linguist and she focuses on the English language. And lately she's been focusing on how the internet is changing the English language. So she actually did a talk at South by Southwest on emoji onto the logistics of them. And the talk isn't only about 
emoji. There's a few chapters on emoji, but there's stuff about, like we say, because internet, or when people say hashtag out loud or something. And it just caught my attention. So I ordered the book and it turned out the book had a lot of the history I was looking for. So I'll be referring to this book a couple times throughout this talk. Um, shout out to this woman, this talk's awesome. At the time that she wrote this book, emoji were about, it really is an interesting read. Um, Emoji were about five years into popularity. So in 2014, there were like 6,000 articles written about emoji. 2018 was titled by Emojipedia, the year of emoji convergence, especially as we got a broader array of emojis and emoji that were more inclusive. So these things aren't going anywhere. And I firmly believe, you know, communication evolves. It evolves continually. It changes. There's words like, I don't know, nobody says bees knees or cats pajamas anymore, right? Like that's just not something that most people say, language evolves, colloquialisms evolve, that sort of thing. And so emoji are kind of adjacent to language, though not necessarily language in themselves. They can be used to enhance the way we communicate. And I think that they do belong in the workplace as long as we use them correctly. It's been especially interesting since we went into this world where we're all virtual to see how people use emoji and things like Teams and Slack and how we use GIFs and other ways to communicate that kind of express our words, ideas, and feelings better than better than words sometimes. So we're going to have a little history lesson. We're going to probably, I don't know the ages of everybody in the room, but for some of you, it's going to be a throwback to our early days of the internet. Um, some of you are probably too young to have heard of some of these things, but we're going to talk about, first of all, what are emoji? The dictionary definition is that an emoji is a small image or icon it expresses an idea or an emotion, and it comes from the Japanese word e for picture and moji for character, and it means picture character. Now, for English speakers, one of the reasons that it became and was adopted so easily was that it was similar to the emoticons, the little smileys that we all used to use before emoji were a thing. In the strictest definition, emoji is not a language. Um, language is an expression ideas the, the linguistic de definition by Henry Sweet is the most common linguistically minded stand or definition for emoji or for language. And it's language is the expression of ideas by means of speech sounds combined into words. Words are combined into sentences. And this combination answers to that of thoughts. And so emoji don't necessarily have that word sounds thing. They also are missing some of those conjunction words like and and but and or and that sort of thing. So they're not a language. Um, and like I said, I like the meme about emoji being hieroglyphics, but strictly speaking, they're also not really hieroglyphics. There isn't enough concrete definition. Like people interpret emojis all different things. Even this, this map of Japan, you could look at it and say it's an island. You could look at it and say it's a map. You could say, hey, that's Japan. So because there's also not that shared definition, at least commonly shared definition of what all those emoji mean and how people interpret them, it also makes it not a language. But they do enhance communication. They can represent our gestures. And in literature, these communications are something called emblems. Emblems are things that fit into a linguistic frame. So for instance, if you can you could say, you can try them in a sentence. So you could say a sentence like, if we're late to the party, then someone will be sad. Or you can say, if we're late to the party, then sad face. And those kind of mean the same thing. So that's the emblem. Other forms of emblems are things like the Snapchat filters that use your real face, um, Memoji, Animoji, all the built-in emoji that a lot of our smartphone keyboards have as well. And what emoji do is they let us express our emotions, our actions, and other things that just aren't easily expressed in a pure text form. So once upon a time, writing looked like this. It was full of illustrations. Some of these pictures are from the Book of Kells, which is located in Ireland, but that's what writing looked like for a long time. That's what books looked like. But of course, at that time, books and language, especially written language, were limited to historical texts, religious texts, and it was like the religious, the scholars, the upper class that had access to it until somebody comes along with the printing press. And the printing press, I would argue started some of this path. So the printing press made it easier for people to 
share information because these books, you know, didn't require things to be hand drawn. But because of the way the printing press was done, it was much easier to engrave letters than it was to engrave images. So images got further removed from at least serious kind of scholarly writing. And part of this was because the printers just didn't want to go and create, you know, 99 different little pictures to represent things. So communication was limited to pure words. Um, for the most part, though, even back then, there was something called a printer's fist, and they would occasionally put it like in the margin of a newspaper or a book. So there were still little pictures here and there, but not as much. So we got to a point where very formal writing was pretty much devoid of pictures. Um, I was kind of thinking of Alice in Wonderland and how she's like, what's the point of a book without pictures? But that's kind of where books have gone, at least for more kind of formal, serious writing. But then informal writing, um, kept finding ways to ornament their text. So again, Alice in Wonderland was the first thing that came to mind when Lewis Carroll did all of these illustrations for Alice in Wonderland, and he kind of used them as an enhancement of some of those scenes that happen in the book. So we have the printing press, um, more and more people have access to information, more and more people can read, and then along come computers. And early computers were really similar to printing presses in that they had very little options for illustration. They just had letters. Engineers, software engineers specifically, being engineers helped with that. So I'm sure some of you have seen this kind of ASCII art with, you know, you use basically words and letters and symbols to make art. And early art looked like this. And people had, um, I remember seeing it sometimes in games that people would play earlier and that sort of thing. It uses a lot of slashes, backslashes, apostrophes. One of the problems with ASCII art, though, is just because it's made up of all these different pieces, it becomes very large. It can be cumbersome to type. Um, I did not type these out. I copy pasted them from a website full of ASCII art because I didn't have the inclination to type these out by scratch. So you had people using ASCII art just kind of for fun. And then you also had the old school, original OG Smiley. Smiley has an interesting story. So it's from Carnegie Mellon is where it originated. And the story is that there was a problem with their computer messaging system. The system normally was like really serious. It was full of computer science talk, announcements, debates, et cetera. But then one day in 1982, message board users were asking all these goofy hypothetical questions about the physics of elevators in free fall. Then someone posted a joke warning that the elevator was contaminated with mercury as a result of an experiment. And the other comp sci professors who were in on the joke thought it was funny. Um, but this was also seen out of context, like some people who weren't part of that mailing list not in on the joke saw it and actually thought that the elevator was out of service because of mercury. So the users of this message board decided to brainstorm ways to indicate when a message was a joke. And a guy named Professor Scott Fallman posted a message using this little smiley that I just posted. It spread quickly because it was easy to type and it quickly started to spread beyond the department. And then people started creating you know, hearts and roses, um, little kitty cat faces, all sorts of stuff, other art. And these things became known as emoticons. And I think to this day, you can still sometimes tell like when somebody started using the internet by whether or not they add the nose to the smiley, because as kind of a newer generation of users started doing that smiley, they would remove the nose. So you see a note in the chat says, ASCII art still shows up in code. It's always interesting to open up a source code file and find a large header. Yeah, and not always welcome. That's true, it can be cumbersome and distracting, but for me, I like it because I'm a visual person, uh, but it's cool to see that kind of stuff still used today. So in the meantime, right around this was happening, emoji were starting to evolve in Japan as well. And it's honestly Japanese, specifically Japanese mobile carriers that we have to thank for emoji. So there was an early computer framework in Japan called ASCIINET, and people used, and hopefully get the pronunciation right, but people used Kaomoji characters. Now Kaomoji are like emoticons, but you read them face on rather than sideways. So they look like this with the eyes and then a straight mouth. One of the interesting things that I thought was that eyes are to the Japanese culture very important for communication. And so 
when they came up with their early emoticons, they emphasized on changing the eyes and the facial expression would stay the same. So the top one is indicating surprise, the bottom one is indicating, you know, crying. In American emoji, initially, we focus on the smiley face or the frowny face and the eyes are always the same because we communicate more with our mouths. So interesting little piece of cultural difference that I learned. There's some more, you know, the Kamoji got a little bit cuter. They got a little, um, sort of making little kitty cats and stuff. This little penguin I thought was super cute. Um, using some of the actually Unicode characters as well as just the standard letters and numbers to make this art as well. And then in the late 90s, people started sending picture messages on cell phones. And those were taking up way too much data. And so a Japanese cell phone carrier called SoftBank found a solution in 1997. They encoded common pictures into text characters. So like these two pictures, this little grinny face and this, it looks like a margarita or a martini, were two of the original 90 small pictures that were implemented by the SoftBank company. And they showed common things, weather, transit, sports, um, hearts, hands, and faces. And I learned a fun fact in that this is the original, full original emoji set. This has actually been added to the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I never considered emoticons having dialects either. It's really interesting how, you know, you have these two clashes, but then they've combined and now this is kind of a universal thing. The problem was we ran into a situation with something called emoji fragmentation. And so people would send an emoji and it would look one way on one platform and a different way on a different platform, or it just wouldn't come through at all. Um, even now you'll see it with like, my sister's on an Android, I'm on a Apple or an iPhone. And so whenever a new set of emoji comes out, my phone gets them before hers does. So if I send a newer emoji to her, it doesn't come through. But at some point it was just getting to the point where these emoji were not useful. I actually, I think I cut the faces out to make this fit. <laughs> so as other cell phone manufacturers started making making emoji, they decided they needed to have a consistent code basically. So that when I send you the sunshine, you actually see a sunshine, even if you're on a different cell phone carrier. And so eventually all of the cell phone platforms and carriers got together and worked together to make emoji look more consistent. And this brings us to the Unicode Consortium and their relationship to emoji. So the Unicode Consortium, they standardize numbers, codes for letters, numbers, and punctuation. I really liked the way that the author of Becomes Internet described it. She said that the Unicode Consortium lives at the intersection of tech geek and font nerd. They're mostly employees of major tech companies that are basically trying to make sure that symbols show up correctly when we copy and paste them. So they're a nonprofit. They focus on developing, maintaining, and promoting the Unicode standard, which is a standard for encoding and rendering text expressed in writing systems. It's also what emoji are based off of. At this point on their board, you have Google, Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, Netflix, all have voting seats with the Emojipedia folks. Some other companies that are involved with them are Twitter, Tinder, who has a really interesting part to play in this story, and we'll get to that toward the end, um, Amazon, and Oracle. So in 2000, 2000 the um, basically the cell phone carries went to the Unicode Consortium and asked them to help create consistency among the emoji, and they turned it down. It wasn't until 10 years later in 2010 that the Unicode Consortium decided that they would take on and manage and standardize emoji. And the main reason they did that is that companies like Gmail and Apple were advocating really hard for them to do it. And when giant tech companies are trying to get you to do stuff, eventually you listen. And so now the Unicode Consortium is actually who decides whether or not new emoji will be adopted, how they look. They release, there's a whole process to getting new emoji in place. So anybody can propose a new emoji. Um, I went on, last year I spoke at a conference around this time called Antarcticomf and it was on a cruise ship in Antarctica in South America. It was awesome. It happened right before lockdown. Could geek about it forever. But one of the guys on that trip with us was actually in the process of submitting an emoji. And it was a like he has a pet ferret. 
And so he was proposing a ferret emoji to the emoji, to the Unicode consortium. And they actually wound up pairing him up with somebody who had proposed a weasel emoji, and they were trying to get that emoji added to the new set of emoji. And I think it still hasn't made it through like its final round, but um, he and I talked a little bit about that process. But basically, anybody can propose an emoji. They can submit a proposal, and Unicode decides whether to adopt them. You fill out, it's literally called the form for emoji proposals, and you include an image, and then they look at a lot of different selection factors. So look at compatibility, is it compatible with high use systems? You know, if they're cell phones and everything else. They look at the expected usage level, including frequency, multiple uses, uses and sequences, novelty. Like I remember early on with emoji being annoyed that there wasn't a taco emoji. emoji. It's like, I would use a taco emoji all the time and there's no taco emoji. But apparently enough people wanted a taco emoji that the Unicode Consortium decided we should now have a taco emoji. They look at distinctiveness to see if it actually looks like what it's supposed to represent. And they look to see if it fills in a gap. Like, we have a heart emoji in every possible color now, so they probably don't need any more heart emojis. And then it goes into a review. There's a feedback process. There's some tweaking with it. And over time, it may be announced or released into uh, the newest ground of emojis. So I liked this quote. Um, and it's kind of an argument that people make against emoji is that why do we need them to communicate? Shakespeare communicated only with words. That should be good enough for us. And we've tried other ways to demonstrate our visuals in, in um, written speaking. So like at one point somebody proposed actually a sarcasm font. Somebody tried to put a sarcasm sy symbol. Like there were a lot of different things we've tried to standardize some of this electronic communication and that was the first thing that actually stuck. So why did emoji win and why have they become so important? Well, technically they're easy to type, um, but they also take up a limited size. So GIFs are fun and we use GIFs a lot as well. And we're gonna talk about that, but there's a lot of variety in GIFs. They're very large, they're distracting. The blinking can you know, actually hurt people's eyes and stuff. So GIFs aren't necessarily the, necessarily the solution. Um, <laughs> sarcasm markers do sound like a great idea. So it's somebody in the chat. And emoji replace things like LOL and XO. They're kind of in between a GIF and just regular font. And they're in a menu you can access. You can see your frequently used emoji or your recently used emoji in your emoji keyboard so you can find your stuff you're using. As far as emoji usage, probably unsurprisingly, facial expressions are actually the most popular emoji that are used. They add cues, they provide subtext. They can indicate active listening even. I wish there was a way to indicate a head dot emoji, but I don't know if that's a thing. And then they kind of succeeded when some of these font and word proposals failed because they are not a language, but they're kind of adjacent to a language. So basically emoji were adopted so easily because the frequency and the way that we write has changed. And so before we can apply emoji, emoji effectively at work, we're gonna geek out a little bit more about language and English. Um, I see in the comments, I think because over 70% of communication is nonverbal, emoji supplements our language and makes connections more dynamic. Exactly, exactly. And especially now when we're doing a fair bit of our communication in Teams and Slack and everything else rather than in person. So we can make up for some of that body language and stuff you're missing. So we're going to geek out a little bit more about language. I have a degree in philosophy and political science, which is a very, with a Spanish minor, so very writing heavy degrees. So like my language geek and my tech geek are kind of really excited about this talk together. So there are two types of writing, basically there's formal and informal writing. When we learn to write, we learn based on formal English rules. Also, when we learn to, when we learn a second language, like when I started learning Spanish, I learned it based on formal rules, but we don't talk that way. We talk a lot more informally. And a lot of times early on when people were doing all this formal writing, there, were, you know, there weren't professions that were doing a lot of writing once they graduated school. Um, so people were doing a lot of writing in school, but then not afterwards, but now everybody writes. Every time you send a text message, 
every time you send a tweet, every chat you send, you're writing. And we write closer to the way that we talk in informal writing. And so more and more people have started communicating with this kind of informal sort of efficient writing. Like I find myself a lot of times, I'll find myself writing some of those interjections. I'll be like, okay, well, and you don't need that in a text, but I tend to text the way that I write. And so we've gone from this kind of formal writing to this is a screenshot of a conversation between my partner and I. Uh, as you can see, there are very few words in here. There's a lot of faces. He sent me a TikTok. I thought it was funny. I was dying of laughing. And he said, hashtag facts. Um, and then asked about the Slack outage. I said, we use Teams. And I sent like the icky face. And then he sent me a GIF. It was like, it'll be OK. Calm down. And it was just, it was really funny because when he sent this text exchange tab and I was working on this talk, I'm like, it's a perfect example of communicating without you know, without just words. We have we have a TikTok, we have a fake hashtag, we have a GIF, and we have three emoji in, you know, not a very, not a very long text exchange. Um, so informal communication, right? Like it lends itself to efficiency, shorter words, the internet abbreviations, you know, LOL, the WTF, all that stuff we use. And as somebody was saying in the chat earlier, writing on the internet has to make up for a loss of body language, tone, facial expressions, and gestures. And formal verbal communication doesn't have a lot of those gestures, you know, but informal verbal communication and written communication do. So this has kind of been part of the evolution of language and how we write and how we communicate. So emoji are just one way that we can add nuance and emotion to our writing. And the move toward informal writing has presented challenges for conveying emotion, subtext, and nuances. So we've developed some other ways that we compensate as well through verbal communication. We use utterances. These are the things like, like the word like, which I just said I shouldn't be saying, um, OK, but those little interjections that don't show up in text messages. So one way that we can show those interjections in text message is to put line breaks in between messages. Somebody sends me something shocking and I'll put a line break or something between the OMG and then whatever my thought is. Um, also, line breaks make things easier to read. They can help conversations flow. Sending really long blocks of text can be hard because then it's harder for the other person to respond to all of those things. So because we're seeing things visually and verbally, we can't maybe necessarily parse and respond to things as easily when it's this big, long block of text. So it's better to break your ideas into smaller components with line breaks as well. Interesting thing, we actually are not using periods very much in short and formal text communications. And sometimes ending like a text message with a period can actually be viewed as being short or passive aggressive. So I'll give you an example. A former friend of mine and I, she had a birthday and we hadn't, you know, she hadn't been doing well she had a birthday. She hadn't really been talking to me, but I just like reached out and said our happy birthday. It was like actually a bit emoji. I sent her a little happy birthday message. And she just wrote back, thanks, period. And I instantly interpreted that as like she was just completely done. She was cutting me off. She was maybe being a little passive aggressive. It, it's just really weird how that one little punctuation mark sometimes can be a little bit almost triggering. And so I've noticed like a lot of times we just don't necessarily use periods in the informal writing, at least not for the last sentence. Like I see, even in the chat, I see some people are ending stuff with periods, some people aren't, and it's really interesting to watch. I see a lot of exclamation points too. So the other thing about online communication is it happens in near real time. It's intuitive, it's easy to create, and so we start to build this kind of typographical tone of voice. And things that convey typographical Tone of voice, all caps, you know, we read those as shouting or somebody is too old to use their keyboard properly. And then people do things where they'll like repeat the last letter of a word for emphasis. So OMG, G, 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 like really shocked, oh my God, or yay with a bunch of Ys on the end. Like you're super pumped, super excited. People started doing that sort of stuff to emphasize and decorate our typed writing. And then as we all got better and more comfortable typing, we started getting better at creating like nuance and tone in our writing before we even had emoji. We've always enhanced our words. So 
I remember people were doing this like glitter text is what it's called with like the tilde and the little star. I don't know why people were doing this with the different punctuation, but it's a thing people did, you know, mix of capital and lowercase letters. I think it's hard to read, but if anybody remembers like AOL Instant Messenger, I distinctly remember putting these little like tildes and stars in my AOL Instant Messenger um, profile. You also have things like exclamation points, they convey warmth, sincerity, excitement. My first, my personal favorite punctuation mark, I probably overuse it, but that's okay. Um, you had people also using things like um, pseudocode, these like slashes like end rant. So I just posted this, like if I was posting rant on the internet, in this case, somebody said corgis aren't the cutest in the world, slash end rant. And that's something that we borrowed from some programming and some, the old like multi, muds, multi, the dungeon diving games, multi-use dungeons, I don't know. Anyway, the, the like dungeon diving text-based games that people played, we borrowed some of that. And then you have, of course, the hashtags. And people use hashtags sometimes to convey moods. And initially these were used on like Flickr and Twitter to tie ideas together. But nowadays we sometimes use the hashtags just for fun, like, I, like in that message or that text a few slides back that I showed that said hashtag facts. And there was actually in 2010, a writer from The Onion patented this little swirly mark with a dot on it and called it the Sark mark to indicate sarcasm and tried to get people to buy it for $1.99 each. And it clearly was not successful and it wasn't adopted, but we've been struggling or finding ways to express ourselves even with you know just writing before we had emoji. So at work, where do all of these things come up? I know I said they have a place at work and I do stand by that. I think that um, emoji can enhance your written communications, but like everything, you need to be careful. You need to use some common sense, um, but emoji, as we've talked about a little bit, they help make up for lack of body language and written text. We rely on, somebody said 70% of our body of communication is from body language and we have profile pictures, right? So you can see somebody's face, but my profile picture looks the same regardless of whether I'm typing something that's happy or sad or mad or whatever. Like the expression is always the same in my profile picture. It's always a smile and that can be a little odd. <laughs> yes, do not send the CTO the middle finger as a pointer finger, at least not in America because it has different meanings elsewhere. Um, research has showed that it's harder to communicate without your hands and emoji help make up for some of that, the illustration of our speech. When you're using emoji at work, there are kind of some, some best practices, both from a reading standpoint and a just kind of communication clarity standpoint. So emoji should be an enhancement, not a replacement for words in most cases. If it's something very self-explanatory, like my laptop emoji, right, is broken. That's pretty obvious. But for the most part, especially at work, because there's, you want to be sure that your communication is clear, you want to use it as an enhancement, not a replacement for your words. Uh, they actually did some queries, the folks at SwiftKey, um, at Microsoft Swift, SwiftKey actually did some queries into emoji usage, and they found out that most people use emoji, just one to two of them either alongside words or in response to a statement. And they had expected to see things like people using maybe the red slash for negativity with something you don't like after it, or a person followed by an arrow indicating somebody going somewhere, but we don't usually tell stories with emoji. Instead, we use them to add on to our messaging. So of the top 200 combinations of emoji, half were repetition of the same character, and repetition of series was always common. And then after that, it was strings of related objects and hearts. So a common emoji combination I use is a soccer ball and a yellow heart because my soccer team wears yellow. And so I wind up using, you know, the soccer ball with a yellow heart or a black and yellow heart. You want to use no more than three emoji. I thought this was really interesting that there's like a, a requirement there, but any more than that, things get confusing. And I. With my friends, I'll send like a gazillion emoji, but in work communications, I do keep them limited to two to three. 
and I do that a lot with like my social media, my Instagram posts, I'll throw some emoji at the end of it just for kind of flair. Consider the lemma of formality. This should go without saying, but consider what you're writing is formal versus informal and keep them out of formal documents like proposals, project plans, user documentation, unless necessary, because at times you might need an emoji um, and anything legal or otherwise serious. So for instance, today at work, I was working on a budget proposal for sponsoring conferences and events this year. That was a formal document. It's going to high level leadership. It gets no emoji and it has a different tone of voice than um, like the texts I was sending, you know, the side chats I was sending to my coworkers about this budget with the gifts and everything we were all bantering with. So it was pretty funny to see this very serious budget document alongside this like goofy conversation about trying to plan for events in a pandemic. And you wanna consider your company culture. Like some, call, some companies just don't have this culture of emoji. Um, I once worked at a place where we were actually instructed to use Slack reaction emoji for certain things like, hey, if you've seen this, respond with a green check mark or something. But I've also worked at places where nobody uses emoji. So you wanna continue consider company culture and consider the relationships of the people you're writing to. Wait to see how the other person uses emoji if they do. Um, there can be generational differences. There can be like level of closeness instances or differences. One thing that I always thought was interesting was I used to be a tech recruiter and there was this progression of formality to informality with some of my candidates. So they would formally apply through the job board or maybe they'd email me a resume and a cover letter. And at first the conversation would be very, hi, Cassandra, you know, I hope you're doing well, blah, blah, blah. And then you'd stop dropping off the hi, Cassandra and just like respond with one line. And then sometimes we would move it to text because it's just easier to text sometimes than it is to check your email. And so I knew when a candidate went from formal emails to informal emails, they were getting a little bit more interested. And when they went from the informal emails to text message, I was like, ah, now we were building a rapport. And then when they sent an emoji, I knew like we were gonna have a good relationship. It was just something about they reached this comfort level where they were okay sending me an emoji. And that to me meant that they, we basically built up a rapport, we built up a trust level, we built up a relationship and that opened the door to a whole new set of communication. And so just consider who you're talking to, consider with relationship. There are, Definitely downsides and challenges to emoji. We'll talk through some of these and some of the guidelines to help you make the most of them. First of all, there's just confusion. There was actually an article in 2017 about the most confusing emojis explained, and one of them was that upside down smiley face. Um, one of them was actually one of the hand, like the high five hand expression. People were confused by that. Um, so it was kind of a fun little article. So at work, stick to the more self explanatory emoji, the facial expressions, especially the more basic ones, the objects that represent objects you're working with. Um, you know, the green check mark can be a good one, the plus one or the, like the 100% symbol, those can all be good, fairly self-explanatory, not easy to misinterpret emoji because people have different interpretations of the same emoji and use them sparingly. Um, like I said, there's, you know, a limit, you don't want to use them all over the place, even though I want to, it just, it gets distracting at some point when you just see a sea of little yellow pictures all over your page. The other thing with emoji, and I told you we were gonna talk about Tinder and emoji, this is where we do. So emoji have just become more representative and more inclusive in the last few years. They were initially all like yellow faces, just like the yellow smileys and the only explanation that I could find for why we had yellow emojis to start is because Apple said they wanted yellow emoji. So what Apple wanted with emoji, Apple got. So they initially became yellow, but people were starting to push back in not feeling represented by those like yellow face default emoji. And then, so over time, you know, they started making more like skin tones, hair tones, stuff like that for emoji. Um, I, use, I use the one with the brown hair a lot because I have, well, brown hair. But then in 2019, the Tinder team plus the Emoji Nation tech activist group actually worked to make emoji even more race and gender inclusive. So they were partially behind the drive to show 
multicultural families or multiracial families. They were described the behind the drive to show things like people in the, the hijab or different hairstyles or people with disabilities, different family dynamics, and then the non-binary gender emoji. So there's a lot of work done to make emoji be more inclusive, which I thought was really interesting when that all happened. And it's all because Tinder users were apparently wanting to be able to represent themselves better when they were communicating. So when you're using emoji, don't make assumptions. If I'm sending one of the emoji that looks like a person, the, the person behind their laptop, you know, the doctor, whatever, if I don't know the person or know that they choose a certain, you know, hair color for that, I just send the default yellow emoji instead of assuming that they might want to be represented by the one with the red hair or the black hair or whatever. So don't make assumptions. Um, use the default skin cones. Those are little things that can help emoji feel a little bit more inclusive, at least until um, somebody starts using, you know, certain emoji back at you. I had a manager once and he always used the emoji. He was he was Indian and he would use the emoji with a turban on its head to represent himself. And I would have never assumed and done that, but since then it was one that he used and he expressed it. So we would use that one periodically when talking back and forth. So just be aware of your audience, be aware of their concerns and their preferences. The other thing about emoji is that from an accessibility standpoint, and hey, there's one of the uh, disability emojis, the, uh, the one for the sight impaired. So emoji are hard for screen readers. And I did a lot of looking into this and looked at kind of some um, blindness advocacy groups and stuff. And the thing with a screen reader is that a screen reader will read the emoji out loud. And so for instance, my grandma is called Honey. We, that's what we call her. And on, my, on her contact on my cell phone, I have a bumblebee next to it. And so when a screen reader or a Siri reads it out loud, it reads it as honeybee because it interprets the emoji as a word. And so they can be very distracting, especially if you are um, not using punctuation. So one of the better practices for using emoji with screen readers is to put a period before the emoji because then the screen reader knows that there's a pause rather than saying, um, use punctuation honeybee. Like it, it just, it flows better with that pause in there. Also sending a lot of emoji that are the same color or the same shape can make it hard to distinguish, especially if people aren't using magnifiers alongside their screen readers. So it's basically just some like formatting things you can do. Uh, putting periods afterwards and before emoji, like I said. Um, keep emoji at the end of messages and don't put a call to action after them. So one thing that I read was somebody said that her friend was texting her to make plans and put like the margarita on the taco emoji in the midst of this text message and then asked, you know, it was like, hey, I'm super excited to get dinner, taco emoji, margarita emoji. And then she asked, what time do you want to meet up? And this person, because of the way the screen reader is reading it, she actually missed that, um, that call to action after the emojis. And so what that message should have said is, hey, I'm excited to have dinner tonight. What time do you want to meet up? Then the taco and margarita emoji so that the screen reader would read it and interpret it in the proper order. Um, and again, limit emoji to two to three per communication. Within your team at work, if you have a question as to whether you should use a certain emoji or GIF, don't send it. Um, if it's something, and this can get really sketchy with GIFs. We had, actually just had one at work the other day, somebody was sending like a make it rain emoji with you know somebody throwing money. And at a glance, it looked like the person in the GIF wasn't wearing a shirt, when in reality, she was wearing a flesh colored tank top. But we all like did a double take at that emoji or at that GIF. So, you know, that was fine because he knew the culture and knew it would be fine in that private chat. But like, keep it professional, know your audience. And if it's a questionable emoji, don't send it. So like the middle finger GIF, don't send that to your boss. Um, follow your team's lead. I don't start diving in with emoji and GIFs until I see other people doing it. Same with conversations on Twitter um, and elsewhere. And for now, keep them out of formal writing. I would not be surprised if that changes over time, but for now, keep your emoji to formal writing. So kind of this is where we went from the smiley, the ASCII art, to the original set of emoji to this is a screenshot from my frequent emoji from like last week or something like to th these very highly detailed pictures. 
<laughs> pretty horrific workplace gifts. Yep. So um, basically, it, it's these communications, they've come a long way. We can use emoji at work. We can use them effectively. Just, you know, make sure you use some common sense and you're keeping in mind your audience and their, you know, all of their needs. And that is it. Uh, these are my dogs. Pippin is the tan one and Katie is the black one. They were thankfully very quiet throughout this presentation, but I always put them on my thank you slides. Uh, that's my Twitter handle at Cassandra Ferris. Email is Cassandra Ferris at quickenloans.com. Um, you can find me all over the place in that Twitter handle. <laughs> thank you for the, the applause emoji. I appreciate it. Um, would love to have questions or share stories about emoji usage, whatever you all want to do. Cool. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Yeah, let's definitely see some applause in the chat there. Um, we really appreciate Cassandra coming and doing this talk. This is a world premiere, by the way. Just want everybody to know. Uh, correct, Cassandra? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. It, it's been, been a long time coming, right? Yeah, it was supposed to be given at DevSpace two years ago, and I was laid off and couldn't travel. And it was oh. supposed to be given at code stock this summer and obviously we all got grounded so hey i see chris style in there that's one of my friends rylan um didn't know he was in here cool so is there anything else you want to call out i know you mentioned social media so there's things places where people should follow you things that you want to mention before we go follow me on twitter um that's my preferred social media platform i keep up on my DMs there better than I do anything except maybe text messages. Um, and my Twitter is a, it's a combination of things. There's some tech, there's some soccer, there's some corkies, there's a bunch of other stuff. But um, follow me on Twitter. My DMs are open if people want to talk about stuff, geek out about stuff. Um, and then I guess stay tuned for other events once we get out into the world again. Woo yeah, I love it. So. With that, again, Cassandra, you rock. But we're going to move on to, as promised, we're going to give away that JetBrains license. So all, to enter, all you have to do, like Mubot says, just type hashtag JetBrains in the chat, and you will be entered in the giveaway. This is always pretty cool because you get a free JetBrains license. They make great stuff. Um, while you're doing that, I want to remind you all next month is going to be, um, don't forget to sign up for our, what time is it anyway? Meet up. Dates and times are really challenging to work with. And Tyler is going to share all of his secrets with us. And you really want to know these secrets. So sign up for that. I think that uh, Randy just dropped that link in the chat there. So look for that. And... We'll give just an, another second for people to sign up. To, it looks like I'm not seeing any more coming in right now. So, Kat, whenever you're ready, go ahead and do the drawing. All right. Uh, and, uh, uh, Tulos, uh, you've won. Yes, well done. So we'll get in contact with you and make sure to get you that JetBrains license. All right, first, and as we're exiting, I wanna make sure to thank the attendees again. We love you and we would love to hear any feedback you have for us. If you could think of any way for us to make Cincinnati Software Crafts which is better, please reach out to us and let us know. You can message us on Meetup, or you can find me on most platforms. Finally, join us on Zoom. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk emoji, and you don't want to miss out. So we'll see you over there in just a moment, and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you all again. Have a great night.